Welcome back to what seems to be a monthly installment on beating BMW's dead horse. I mean, it's definitely low hanging fruit. It seems that every time I've reviewed a BMW design over the last year, we always have, or at least I always have the same negative reaction. And at this point, I just don't want to make these kind of videos anymore. But having taken a quick look at it, actually, it's not as bad as you or I might have thunk. So without further ado, let's get into my eagerly anticipated review of the BMW new 7 Series. Now this is easily the most luxurious and high-tech BMW that they've ever produced. The competition is immense, enormous against this car. They have to go up against the new S-Class and the new Audi A8. And it's this competition precisely that is bringing out exciting intentions from BMW with this new 7 Series. My first impression with this vehicle is, again, a bit of surprise because there seems to be an element of design control with the shape of this car. On first impression, this car definitely has a distinct face, albeit with elements that I've seen in other cars. But for a BMW, you do have to say that the front of this car is not as crazy and irresponsible, I would have to say, as some of the previous BMWs we've seen. But the car does have sort of more of an architectural, more of a linearity type of design to it. But the way they handle the lines all the way around the car, this seems to be a single designer's purpose and intent for a car. In general, the car does seem to be holding better to the principles of BMW's historical design features. And I think they're coming to realize with this car, they can't play around as much as they have in the past. If I get into the design and start analyzing it, there are going to be things that I like and don't like about it. But most of all, the front end does, in a light color, tell you that it's a big car. They have not gone back to the smaller grills that we recognize from past BMWs, especially back in the, again, the E38 days, what we call the halo headlamps, the round ones with the light rings. With the new one here, it's more of a T-type architecture. The large front grills, albeit smaller than the 2020 version, but still quite large, definitely in my opinion, still too large. The top segment of the running lamps for me always will be a no-no, as well as the hidden lamps being hidden and tucked away. That is quite interesting because it does provide a new type of interpretation of a headlight design that we've never seen before, but had they eliminated the top running lamps on the top, the segment there, and incorporated those into the main headlight area, then you would probably have really achieved a very unique look, one where you almost don't even think the car has headlights, which is a return to the days of yore when we had the pop-up headlamps. Nobody complained about that. And in fact, it was a very positive feature. People loved the days of the pop-up headlamps. That, in conjunction with the smaller front grille, would definitely give this new BMW a very unique front end character. The front end of the car, again, has a lot of presence. It's very vertical in the front, which is characteristic of a lot of luxury cars but downsizing the size of that grill to a more reasonable size. The moment the grill intakes remind me of old cars, because it's an electric engine, I can understand that it's perhaps not needing as much air as on the petrol version, but it still fills up the front end and looks a lot more uh, stately, a lot more presence, a lot more importance to the front end of the design. More quiet, not quite as ballsy as the uh, 7 Series. The aggressive version on the 7 Series for me is for the, I don't know, somebody who wants to understand the power under the hood and sort of communicate that, that feeling that you have that 12 cylinder or the six cylinder under the hood. And that will obviously connect with the, the design aesthetics of the front end. As 
we move to the side of the car, the first thing that I noticed is it looks, again, like a BMW. They've even eliminated things, namely the hockey stick, the L-shaped hockey stick that goes in a straight line from the rear, front of the rear wheel towards the front, and previously sort of gradually kicked up at a angle, then lately kicked up at almost a 90 degree angle. That now is gone. That, that chrome embellishment feature that really pushed it is gone, which is thankful that L hockey stick for me never made any sense. Then as we look up the car, you're gonna see things that are recognizable. BMW's had, and I say it in German because that's the only way I can crease perhaps, Zicke is the line that goes horizontally through the shoulder from the front of the car, almost touching the front headlamp, almost, going straight through the shoulder with a bit of tension. That line is not straight. It's gonna have a little bit of an arc, a little bit of bow that was all the way across the side of the car and just kisses the rear tail lamp. And that is absolutely beautifully controlled, beautifully executed. Congratulations to the whoever worked on the BMW design team on that feature, as well as the clay modelers and as well as the digital modelers, because they've got that nailed. Then you work up from that and you'll start to see things around the greenhouse, around the glass area, that remind you immediately of the BMW uh, heritage, especially with the Hofmeister Knick. What the Hofmeister Kink is, or Knick does, is it's the line that comes off the top of the greenhouse, comes down onto the C-pillar, and then gently curves down to the belt line. Now, when I say gently, it depends on how gentle, because that curve on the Hofmeister Kink, Knick, has been done differently over the different generations. Now, BMW on this 7 Series, I think they've got it almost spot on. It has tension in it. It has a, a real snap to it as it comes around the C-pillar almost down to the base of the uh, waistline of the belt line. But what I'm talking about is the general uh, tendency of the line to come down, sweep down the C-pillar, and then have that, whoo, that curve, that, that nice whip to it down into the belt line works extremely well. Now, as we move into the future, door handles have to move into the future. On a moving object, we're looking, especially on a car, at aerodynamics, flushness, clean looking design, things that don't just look like they landed on the surface. Now, BMW has done some very interesting door handles here. Again, flush with a bit of detail, ornament perhaps to it. They have the chrome surrounds. There's been a lot of thought going into what they want to do there. As you move down, you're going to see that the surface on the door panel on the side of the car has a, a light curvature to the body side. And then as it sweeps in, it comes back out. You'll see that it catches a little bit of light there. And that's always going to change the light reflection, the, the gradient of light, the amount of light catching the surface, and then kicking back under towards the, what you would call the rocker panel, the Schrella. This area there becomes dark and sort of supports the car from underneath and gives it sort of a, a finishing touch. Then you have a slight kick on the Schrella, catches light again, and then again tucks under. So that little transition that you have there is giving the body side a lot less clumpiness, a lot less heaviness to, the, to, to that. There's a lot of control in that surface there to get the lines absolutely in position with the right angle, connecting it from the front bumper through the body side and back in to the rear bumper. Now, the one other element that I don't really like on cars, I've never liked the lips that we have over the wheel openings. Now, what do I mean by lip? That's the hard edge. You'll have the wheel opening above it at different heights on different cars. That is there if you're interested in, 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 in simply for the reason most of the time, just to stiffen that panel. It's an easy way out and we're used to it. And I think that can almost date the design if we keep it as hard, for example, as you see on the BMW 7 Series here. Now, as we come back along the rear quarter panel, sort of the C-pillar area, and then into the rear, the side of the bumper and towards the rear of the car. Specifically right now, I'm looking at the i7. What we're looking at here is something that could perhaps be the equivalent of a modern version of the Bengal butt. Now, it's a very high rear end. If you look at it, you'll see that the tailgate, the tail, the boot, 
on the car is quite high relative to the belt line. The highness of the boot on the rear is quite good, obviously, for packaging reasons. I mean, as long as you can see outwards from inside the car, backwards, that's fine. But that means you're getting extra volume in the trunk, extra volume in the boot for luggage, which is always a good thing on a car of this magnitude of this size. But it's done very, very nicely. Much, much more refined, I guess, than the the, the mid-2000s, 2004 onwards type of uh, BMW rear end design on the 7 Series. Now, moving to the back of the vehicle, straight on rear, or even three-quarter rear, if you want to look at it from that direction, the main problem I have with the rear end is the placement of the registration plate. And this is the first time I've seen it placed that low on a car like the 7 Series, or even if I can recall past BMW 7 Series, I don't think I can remember any of them having the license plate so low. And that takes away, for me, a little bit of the fluidity again of the design. The bumper underneath is such a horizontal piece of design that having it broken up with a reg plate, license plate, is a no-no. I would much rather have the license plate put up into the tailgate, into the rear of the, the, the trunk lid, low down, but in an almost bespoke type of cutout where it doesn't exaggerate the presence of the license plate, if you know what I mean. I think on that trunk lid coming down, there's an optimal placement location for it. You can see it on the lower part of the tailgate there, on the rear of the tailgate. And it could be a lot smaller than it is on the bumper. I don't know why the cutout area for the reg plate. Again, such a minor detail, but that's what we're doing in design. Everything is important as much as anything else on the design. Now the rear light signature on this car, a lot better now than what they've been doing recently. You can see the restraintment, the uh, sort of the L, the very slight L signature that it has, which is a big thing in BMW's rear light treatments of the past. They had a very significant sort of L signature. This is sort of doing it in a much more elegant way. Apart from that, I think the rear end is, is, is again, I mean, how you can say that you would tweak this, tweak that, but the lines are fairly making sense. They're, they're in harmony with each other. And I think the rear end works very well. If I look at the 7 Series petrol version, it turns into something that relates more to the front of the 7 Series with, say, the diagonal fins that are on the front. As you come to the back, you're expecting something also as aggressive and you do get it. You get a very aggressive for this segment rear end. Again, I think it works less well. It's, it's a bit more like shouting than being restrained and responsible. All in all, I think, I think the i7 is much more better executed design-wise, trying a lot less hard. If it was up to me um, and moving towards the future, not that I prefer electric vehicles, I prefer petrol vehicles, but I do prefer the overall control and reservedness, but confident reservedness of the i7 design because it's more cohesive perhaps, not, not features that are standing out and, and, and I wouldn't say begging for attention, but looking for attention. So the overall i7 shape is doing it for me. If I come back to one point that I left out earlier that I'd like to mention that really bugs the heck out of me, the front three-quarter view, this is the last thing I'm gonna say that uh, I'm complaining about. It hurts the more I look at it. The two cut lines that go, one from the front wheel cut out up to the top of the running lamp and the one that comes down from the hood to the corner of the running lamp you'll see that they form sort of a, a very strange offset arrowhead visual there has got to be a better way to control two cut lines than that you know if those two lines weren't even there it would be the optimal solution we can't really do that but from a designer viewpoint, I think that for me, if I was involved, would be the most embarrassing part of design that 
you could be responsible for is not having been able to come up with a, a cleaner solution than two lines that come together kind of gives me the feeling of being a slight mistake. I mean, if I had to give a rating to the interior, it would be very high. Interiors on BMWs are absolutely stunning. Every car I've ever seen from a BMW, mostly. The only thing that I would change on any of the modern type interiors like on the BMW is to try to integrate the screens, the vertical screens that we have into the elements themselves, not stuck on as it would be with just a, a laptop or some type of screen that isn't blended in to the actual architecture, the actual surface of the interior. So having that sort of tablet feel is, is, is not, for me, a modern way of integrating screens into the interiors of cars. But the materials, the design, the, the attention to detail on the interiors of this 7 Series, especially because that's the, as we call it earlier, the flagship of the range, is absolutely exquisite, absolutely top of the top. So congratulations for pushing interior-wise on the BMWs. And all in all, I think it's a very, very interesting, well-executed design. You just give me a... I know that after so many uh, misses from BMW design, having to say that this one looks as good as it does is perhaps uh, a little bit of a, a strange one. It shows they can do it. At the same time, the car isn't, let's call it, revolutionary groundbreaking design, but as a BMW, it perhaps shouldn't be. They've tried breaking new ground with their previous uh, iterations that we've seen. This one seems to have pulled the reins back, held it under control, and they've come up with something that still has a few strange elements of design, namely the headlights and the uh, running lamps and the front grille. But all in all, if those points were refined and restrained perhaps a bit more, you'd have something that was uh, the ninth batter in the lineup coming up and hitting a grand slam home run for all you US fans out there. It does give me a, a feeling of hope that BMW can get back on track with their design language. And again, what I most look forward to is the facelifted version of this car where perhaps we get something that looks even more controlled and more like a BMW. Now it comes down to that always difficult moment of having to give a rating to the design of the vehicle. 100 feet away, I would give this car probably uh, a low eight, maybe an eight two, eight three perhaps. Standing next to it, starting to see, even though it's extremely well refined in terms of surfacing, design details for me are what let it down and size of the graphic elements. For example, I would have to give it a 7.7. .7. Thanks so much again for watching. I know this is going to be a controversial one because perhaps everybody was expecting another BMW bashing, which, you know, it's, there's been a few of them of late and, and it could have been so easy to do it. But there is a certain amount of responsibility and restraint in the design. So I have to give it credit for that. And as always, I look forward to your comments. I read every single one of them. I really enjoy reading them plus or minus, good or bad, what do you think? Looking forward to seeing you in the next video.